So this, um, we're in kind of a weird spot. So it's not Christmas and it's not quite the new year. How many of you guys have lost track of time? Like you have no idea what time it is. You're like, my wife the other day, my kid Brecken was like, what day is it? My wife's like, I don't know. Like, like, do I wear slippers? Can I wear them to the store? Do I have to wear pants to the mailbox? Like, I don't know. Where are we at right now? But I'm excited because I really feel like when we positioned ourselves with expectation this weekend, as we close out this year, I'm really excited about entering in to our new season. How you close a chapter and enter a chapter is everything. And our foundation is everything. Say the foundation. See, we take it for granted sometimes. We show up to this building and you see the ceiling, you see the air ducts, you see the walls. But the truth is this building is only as strong as the foundation that it's been built upon. There's a verse that I have read at the end of every year since I've been able to come here and close out. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this. This is a promise. I just want to speak it over you. If you're a student of the Bible, you probably know it. But it says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. You ever want to make God laugh? Tell him your plans. <laughs> I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not disaster. That's great news. To give you a future and a hope. If you're taking down notes, which we always encourage you to do here at Hope City, the title of my sermon this weekend is Grace for the Pace. Grace for the Pace. I was um, in Columbus, Ohio, preaching uh, a few months ago. Uh, Columbus is where I'm at originally from, and I'm about to give you a pearl here. So if you're not taking down notes, you at least need to remember this. There's a place in Columbus called Jenny's Ice Cream. Yes. It's, she, she already knows about it. It's kind of bougie, but it's delicious. Okay. They just opened one here in Houston. Like this is a big deal. I think it's over in the Heights area. It's uh, delicious. You're going to spend $75, but it's going to be delicious. <laughs> so I went to Jenny's ice cream when I was in Ohio and we're standing outside. It was a pretty nice day. And, and this mom and her son come walking out and there's this little kid and he's holding the little cup with three scoops of premium ice cream. Like this is a lot of money. And he's like, Give me a spoon. I want to eat it. And she's like, you need to be careful. You, look at me. You need to be careful. And they were white. So she's like, Cody, listen to me. Don't make me count to 60. <laughs> 40. Simmer down, Cody. <laughs> so, so she said, like, be careful. You're, you're going to lose that top scoop. See, the funny thing is some of y'all are like, how is this going to turn spiritual? Just wait. John 14, 26. Uh, so, <laughs> says that before Jesus ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father, he left the Holy Spirit here as our helper who helps. You know, the Holy Spirit is always speaking. I said that a moment ago. The Lord will speak to you in life moments, and he'll totally, sh he'll shape and mold and give you direction in life, in life scenarios. He teaches me, my wife, so much through our parenting and through being a husband and her being a wife. And so I'm standing there and this kid is fighting his mom over this spoon and he yanks away from her, sticks the spoon in that top scoop and he catapults this thing like nine feet in the air. I almost snatched it out of the air. I was like, got him. Like I almost did. And it fell landed on the ground and he was devastated. I mean, he was losing it. She was like, I told you, you were going to lose that top scoop. But be satisfied with what's left in the cup. Look at the person next to you and say, what's left in your cup? Come on, ask him. What's left in the cup? And she's like, if you're not careful, you're going to lose what you have left. So I feel like as we're closing out 2019, yes, it's a year. But for some of you, maybe you're looking back through a trail of regret. Maybe you're looking back on things you didn't accomplish. Maybe there was a dream that got squashed. Maybe you lost some things in this past decade and going into 2020, this little kid was wrestling and mad about the one and he was so distracted by what he had lost. He leaned over and looked at what he had lost and the other two scoops of ice cream fell out of the cup on top of the one he had lost. And I was like, <laughs> I didn't do that. That's terrible. Maybe internally I did a little bit. But what's left in your cup? For some of us, when you look in that cup, you may say, yeah, but it's it's not that great. Here's the reality. God can take what you have left and breathe on it and cause the supernatural power of his spirit to be released. What's left in your hand stepping into 2020 instead of focusing on where you've been in your past and all the things that you've walked through. There's a reason why your windshield is bigger than your rear view mirror. God is far more concerned about your future than your past. I believe some of you are going to trade in the sign that you've been wearing around your neck that says damaged goods and fragile. And you're going to trade it in for hope and life. And you're going to trade it in for who you are as a daughter and as a son. 
Grace for the pace. Say grace for the pace. The foundation is everything, though, as we transition and step into, I believe, what will be the greatest assignment of our lives as a church. I was studying this. I'm not super into biblical meanings of numbers. I know eight means new beginnings. That's super cool. But the number 20 means completeness. It's pretty cool. It's literally indicative of a grind, a trial, a valley that you maybe have been going through. And it's showing that at the end of this storm or this season, there is a place of reward. There's a place of wholeness. There's a place of completeness. How many of y'all are excited to step into a place of completeness? Come on, where you feel whole. So here's our foundation. Jesus said these words in Matthew. He said in verse 24 of Matthew 7, it says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man who built his house on the rock. Say the rock. Verse 25 says, the rain came, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had been built on the foundation of the rock. Say the rock. Verse 26, but everyone who hears these words of mine, so it starts the same, but does not put them into practice. It's like the foolish man. You don't want to be that guy who builds his house upon the sand. Same storm, rain came, streams rose, the winds blew and beat the house, and it fell with a great crash. I believe that if we will take this serious and we will step into 2020 with great expectation, if we will consistently live in a posture of 1 Peter 5, 6 that says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, if you will constantly be putting yourself in a position where you're building your life and your foundation on the rock, I'm going to say this over and over. From now on, let's be intentional. Little precursor. From now on, let's start off this year different than we've ever started before. If you've never done the 21 days of prayer and fasting, do it this time. Wake up ready on January 1 to step into what God has called you to. Be intentional about building your life on the rock. Because here's the truth. Jesus talks about our past, and he talks about literally forgetting our past, forgetting about the former things, not focusing on where we've been, but focus on where we're going. Isaiah 43, verse 18 and 19, Jesus says this, but forget all of that. It's nothing compared to what I'm going to do. I'm going to do something new. How many of y'all like new things? Come on. Like new things, like not refurbish. Uh, refurbish isn't bad. Recycle's not bad, but new, like that new car smell. You know, you get in that 87 Honda and they got the little Glade plug in. It's supposed to smell like new car smell. And you're like, it's masking something. <laughs> it's been a dead body in here. I don't know what's happening. There's something about new. And the Lord says, listen, I'm doing something new. And watch this. See, I have already begun. See, God has been fighting for you and opening up doors of Luke 252 favor for you. Y'all are about to step into a new season of increase. You're about to step into a new season. Don't be surprised if you show up and they say, we've been noticing you. We've been talking about you and you're going to get a raise. You're going to get increased. We're about to, come on somebody, are y'all awake today? See, we should expect this. It's already begun. And then the Lord, I believe, connects to us through our humanity in this question. He says, do you not see it? See, I believe we don't see it a lot of times because we get in the way. We, we're caught in that me, myself, and I culture. And the truth is, God wants you to be you. He wants you to be the true you, the authentic, authentic you. God can't use or bless who you pretend to be. There was a season where I really wanted to have an accent. I'll be really honest. I also wanted to have crunchy bangs. It never happened. I don't know what happened. That's not true. It would have been pretty funny. So my wife and I, when we were first married, we would, uh, we would stay in character. So when we would travel and stuff, she'd be like, what do you want to do? You want to do Australia? You want to do Scottish? And I was like, let's do, let's do uh, British. And she's like, let's do it. So we're flying to Maui. And so the whole time they were like, can we get you something to drink? We're like, salsa latte and cranberry juice. It'd be just wonderful, wouldn't it now? And like, we're just... So we're talking and we're literally interacting for about an hour. This guy leans in between our seats and goes, where are you from? I'm like, uh, because I'm in now. Like we're locked into this. And I was like, uh, it's a little place called Manchester. And he's like, that's where I'm from. I'm like, good, good. <sighs> Great. And so Jackie, she's smart. She's like, that's awesome. I'm going to get a little bit of a nap now. And I'm like, so for five premium hours, he's like, so where is it? I was like, well, it's a little village outside Manchester. He's like, Henderson Farm. I'm like, yes, it's close to that place with the sheep. He's like, he has so many. I'm like, he does, doesn't he? Like, 
Here's the truth. Not being the true you is a high maintenance way to live life. And when you step into who God's called you, you'll be comfortable in your own skin. You'll look in the mirror and say, devil, you're going to get tired before I do because the one who's been standing with me and for me will always be stronger than the one standing against me. You'll embrace who you are. You'll recognize who God has called you to be. I was, uh, <laughs> I was reading the other day and I was wondering if I was guilty of this and I was, uh, I was reading, this was shocking. It says that in America, that's us in America, almost a billion dollars worth of gift cards go unused every year. Uh, almost a billion B for those of you who are terrible with that 999 million and then add another million we had a billion dollars of unused gift cards. I'm like, that's crazy. Like, how many of y'all like gift cards? Like, you're gift card people. So my mom's like, can I get you shoes? I'm like, oh, just send me a gift card because you might send me Crocs. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so I started looking at my wallet. Y'all had gift cards from years ago, like a Nordstrom card. I had a Chipotle gift card from like three years ago. That's blasphemy. Like, I should have used that. I had a Starbucks card. I had a Chuck E. Cheese card. I haven't been there in 14 years. Like, <laughs> last time I got pink eye, we didn't go back. You know what I mean? Like, so ski ball every time ski ball. You're like, uh, and then you got pink eye. Hundred, I had over $150 worth of gift cards that I have not used. How many of y'all are guilty of that? You've got gift cards. You know, you have not used. Why are you telling us this? When I read it, I heard the Lord say, challenge the room. How many gifts have I given them that are going unused this past decade? What has God been speaking to you? What did you shelf because of insecurity? What did you shelf because who would help me with this? I believe it's time from now on to get your yes out of the way and step into what God has called you to step into and allow God to unlock the gifts through you. I love what Paul says, because I think there's a misconception that you have to wait till you're polished and perfect. You have to wait till you've got it all together to be used by God. And it's just not true. I love how Paul in Philippians chapter three, verse 12, he's literally describing this moment like, Hey, I haven't arrived. <laughs> I'm a work in progress. We all are. Amen. We all are, are on a journey to just keep getting better and better and grow every day. That's why John chapter three, verse 30 is really important for us to apply every day. It says, I need you to become greater and greater. I need you to increase as I decrease. See, when you decrease and you get out of the way, you open up the opportunity with an open handed life for God to remove distractions and things from your life and pour more of him in. But this is what Paul says. He says in Philippians chapter three, verse 12, he said, not that I have already obtained all this, not that I've already arrived at my goal, but watch this, but I press on to take a hold of which Christ took hold on me of me. Paul, Paul is, is literally talking about being motivated and dedicated to the pursuit of the prize. The word press means literally to flee after. It's like an imaginary runner. Paul is literally describing this moment like a long distance runner. My wife and I have a friend named Kevin who does the Boston Marathon every year barefoot. And so he's like, there's always a moment when I'm running this 20 something mile deal. He said, there's always this moment where I'm running where I hit a wall and I wonder if I shouldn't be doing this. I was like, you should have thought that three months ago when you were barefoot. It's crazy. How many tetanus shots have you had? <laughs> like, and he goes, I always hit this wall and I could, I could choose in that moment. Hey, I've done enough. I'm good. Pass the cup of Gatorade. Let me have a seat and watch everybody else. He said, but I have to break through the wall and I have to choose to press on. For some of you, God has been asking you to press on. He's been asking you to break through that barrier. He's been asking you to break through that wall and step into who he has called you to be and step into. And the truth is it literally just takes willingness. But the enemy wants to try to tell you, you'll never get through it. You'll never step into your purpose. You're washed up. You have no, you, what are you serious? Like who's going to listen, respect, want you to be a part of their team. We do. <laughs> That's why we say, go through the growth track. That's why we're passionate about four specific things here. We want you to know God. We want you to find freedom. We want you to discover your purpose and ultimately make a difference. Where's all my dream teamers at? Come on, wave at me. Amazing. It's literally like a family. Across all of our locations, we are a family growing together. My wife and I are in Minneapolis area, and this pastor wanted us to see his new stage design. He was super pumped about it. And so I went to his church, and I was in the back of the room, and he was like, man, go check that out. And I walked in, 
it was, it was fascinating. So we've got these LED wall, the LED screens, but this guy had the LED screens, but he had this, these massive rock stones. I mean, this thing looked like it cost a ton of money and a ton of time. I was like, bro, this is, this is amazing. He's like, yeah, it's, it, it's all Israel. This is all Israel stone. I was like, yeah. I know she had coffee machines out. He's like, go up a little closer. I was like, okay. And so I, I got about halfway in the room. I was like, it's really fascinating. It looks incredible. And he's like, yeah, yeah, go a little closer. I'm like, I don't know why. He's like kind of pushing me. I'm like, all right, you're bigger than me. And so I go all the way up on the stage and I'm like, yeah, it's, 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 this is amazing. Like, so who stacked this? Like, I'm just making up questions now. Like, who it touched all this? Like, I don't... Because I, I, I cared in the back, but now I'm already so far into this thing. And he's like, go closer. I'm like, okay, you're, I can see a pattern here. So I get all the way up to it. And I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. He's like, touch it. I'm like, why? Why do I need to touch it? He was trying to get a point across to me. And when I got all the way up to it and I touched it, I realized it's not stone at all. He had a Hollywood design team come in that built sets. And it was a paper mache rock covered styrofoam wall, but it looked real all the way up to it. And the Lord spoke to me and said, this is what the enemy is doing to my people. This is what the, he's trying to tell you. You're never going to get through that wall. You can't go over it. You can't go through it. So you're stuck and there's nowhere you can go. Some of you have been stuck since 2009. Some of you, this whole decade have felt like God hit. You just couldn't press through. But the truth is that wall wasn't a wall. You can bust through paper mache. You can bust through styrofoam. Some of you have to rise up with audacious faith and recognize what God is trying to get, not only to you, but ultimately through you. All right, I want to jump through this really quickly. Uh, I was reading this acronym of the word start. The truth is half the battle a lot of times in willingness is just starting, just stepping out. First John 5 verse 14 says, this is the confidence that I have. Watch this. When approaching God, when you say when approaching, that takes movement. When approaching God, that anything I ask according to his will says that he hears us. And I was reading this acronym of the word start, and I'm going to start with the letter S. And it says this, stop making excuses. You can make excuses and you can make progress, but you can't make both. Look at the person next to you and say, be stronger than your strongest excuse. Come on, let them know right now. Be stronger than your strongest excuse. So the yes in this word start, stop making excuses. And the truth is a lot of times we just kind of just, just say whatever we want. Well, I just know well, the reason I can't, well, the reason I shouldn't, well, the reason I'm just not ready. And the truth is you'll believe what you say about yourself more than what anybody else says about you. Your words will carve a path to your future. The Bible says in Proverbs 21 verse 23, he who guards his mouth and his tongue keeps himself from troubles. Your words will box yourself in. And I believe stepping into 2020, we need to stop making excuses about why we can't and from now on be intentional about why we can. I feel like so many times we're talking about how big our storm is instead of talking about how great and big our God is. You know you can overcome. You know you can overcome and be an overcomer. But I'm telling you, we have to stop making excuses. One of my fathers in the faith, he says this, and I teach this leadership principle a lot to our staff. Think twice and speak once. So going into 2020, start having this new mindset that I'm going to think twice and speak once, and I'm going to speak life over myself. The T in the word start is take an inventory of your life. It's going to sound super cheesy because it rhymes, but I'm white chocolate. All right. We have to have an attitude of gratitude. I sat up last night and I started thinking about all that God has done this past 10 years. We had mountaintop moments. Amen. We had valley moments. I literally lost the rest of my hair, like all of it. Like I can't use Dove dry shampoo. Like a lot has changed. But this past 10 years, we've had valley moments and mountaintop moments. But I'm telling you, when you start having an attitude of gratitude and you start looking back at all that God has done, he's been better than good to us. And if he never did anything else but hang on that cross, how many of y'all don't know that it was enough? But John 10, 10 says that even though the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, our God comes to give us life and life more abundantly. I believe going into 2020, we need to look back and go down memory lane and say, yeah, 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 yeah. Look at all that God has done good for me. Now listen, there's a, there's a, this is important. Your windshield will, needs to be your focus more than your rearview mirror. But sometimes it's good to look back 
and say, God, look at all that you've done. I'm going to focus on what you've been doing good in my life instead of focusing on all the things that have gone wrong or could have gone wrong. Can you give God praise for all that he has done that has been good? Because here's the truth. You've survived 100% of your worst days. You're in this room. You woke up again today. And tough times don't last, but tough people do. The A in start is act in faith. I believe God wants us going into 2020 to have audacious faith. Act in faith. Galatians 2.20 says this, so that it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. The life that I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. I love what Pastor Larry Stock still says out of Baton Rouge at Bethany Church. He says, faith is looking forward to a desired outcome. Trust is looking backward that God holds the answers to any outcome. The R in the word start is refocus, a renewed mind. We have to start looking into what the Lord says and the promises that are yes and amen. Statistically, they say that most Christians go to WebMD before they go to the Bible. We've treated prayer like the glass box on the wall that says break in case of emergency. Your prayer has to be. That's why we keep pushing the prayer and fasting time in January. It has to be your first priority not your last resort. The Bible says in Romans 12 too, I'm giving you a lot of word as we close out. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The T in the word start is trust. The truth is trust is God's love language. He wants our trust. God will never give you a life where he's not necessary. Proverbs chapter three, verse five says, trust in and rely confidently on the Lord, with all of your heart. Do not rely on your own insight or your own understanding. How many of y'all are guilty of that? We all are. It's called humanity. But I think from now on, we start choosing as we step into 2020, God, I'm going to trust you. Would you close your eyes just for a moment? Just lift your hands open-handed for a moment. Well, why do I need to do it open-handed? Again, it's a posture and a position that says, take anything out. That might be a distraction. Take anything out that's standing in the way of me truly living my best life. Take anything out, God, that could be robbing me of my gifts. Take anything out that could keep me from stepping into my call. God, we're going to trust you. The truth is, Lord, we want to live more committed to our future than we are to our past. God, I pray that you would meet every single person the sound of my voice, not only in this room, but across all locations and additional seating. God, as we close out one year and we close out one decade and we step into a new decade of completeness, a new decade of wholeness, there's some things that we need to let go of. There's some things that we need to surrender. There's some baggage we've been carrying around and you want us to replace it with a garment of praise. Would you stand to your feet as we bring this in? for a complete landing. Y'all are doing great. You're still going to beat the Baptist to Golden Corral. Let's go. This is what I want to do. And this is going to be a little uncomfortable for a few. And listen, if this is your very first time, Pastor Jeremy will be back next week. So grateful that you did decided to come hang out with us though. I want to do something that feels a little symbolic, but sometimes I feel like these moments, God wants us to step out of our comfort zone. There's a story that I read growing up in Exodus chapter three. And if you're a student of the Bible, you know the story of Moses. Moses is feeling inadequate. He's feeling overlooked. He's feeling underappreciated and undervalued. And his father-in-law Jethro, who sounds super country, is like, I need you to watch the flock. <laughs> like, and so Moses is like, I've got nothing else going for me. I've got the speech impediment. I'm literally making no difference. Sure. I- I- I'll go take care of it. Now, after my dad stopped hustling and beating up people and cheating and using and all the addictions stopped in my family, man, we were in church. So in Sunday school, we got the felt, felt pieces and they were like, this is Moses. He was awkward. We're like, I don't know why you have to say that. And so like all the felt, so I know this story, but something came alive in me when I really began to dive into this story a few years ago in Exodus chapter three, verse one, you can look at the screens. It says this, I'm going to walk you through the story because I want you to grab this. Now Moses was tending to the flock of Jethro's father-in-law, who was the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, which is also called the mountain of God. Verse two, 
There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of fire from within the bush. So Moses thought, I'm gonna mind my own business. As now my, I don't need to worry about that. I'm just gonna move the flock away. That's not what it says. Because here's the truth. I've said this for years, and this verse proves it. That God is not a forcer, he's a filler. He'll never force himself on you. God is God. He could have put a wall of fire in front of Moses to get his attention. But instead he just, just lit one bush. Moses, because in those days, in like today, a lightning strike could start a wildfire, no big deal. And shepherds knew we have to steer around it. But this particular day, Moses said, go back, go back a verse. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. God was waiting on Moses to turn aside because God's not a forcer, but he's a filler. And if you'll turn aside and you'll make room, he'll fill every time. If you'll make room during this 21 days of prayer, he'll fill every time. Next verse, watch this. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, what? When the Lord saw that he had taken a step and would go over and look, watch, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. He didn't say, hey, you. He didn't say, you'll do. No, he knows you by name. He calls you by name. Others might have ran out on you, but he knows you fearfully and wonderfully made, shaped and molded in the image of God. He called Moses by name. Moses felt undervalued and overlooked. And in this moment, he felt validation and affirmation from a God who cared. Moses, Moses said, here I am, Lord. And watch this. We know this. If you know the story, he said, kick off your shoes, take off your shepherd Crocs. That's in the message translation. He said, take off your shoes. Why? Because today you stand on holy ground. Such a cool story. Next page. No, no, no. There's so much more depth to this story. Watch this. It was a custom to their day that any time you were about to go from being a peasant to the palace, any time you were about to inherit something, any time you were about to be promoted, they would not allow you to wear the shoes of where you've been because they didn't want you to drag the residue of where you've been into where you were about to go. See, some of you are trying to drag residue the past 10 years into your new season of promotion. You're about to be upgraded. You're about to be promoted. Your glory days and those messy moments, I refuse. My wife and I refuse to drag the residue into this new decade. Would you do me a massive favor? And this is going to be the part that's super uncomfortable. Would you kick off your shoes? I see y'all didn't know. Can you, can you get a tight shot? See, I wore my pineapple socks. Can y'all get in on this? Anybody at all? Can you just zoom in on the, no, anybody? All right. Yeah, there we go. I put the pineapple socks on because I knew this moment was going to happen. All right. Some of y'all are like, I haven't painted my toes. Feel no pressure at all. And listen, this is not a shoe drive. This is not, but ushers keep an eye on them. We might need to send some Yeezys right there. We might need to, all right. Pay attention. Look at me real quick. Why, why are we doing this? This just seems ridiculous in the natural. It also seemed ridiculous in Joshua 6 when a bunch of dudes walked around a wall in a whole city six times and didn't say anything. But on the seventh time, they begin to rejoice and shout. The walls begin to fall. It seemed ridiculous in Matthew chapter 9, verse 20, when the woman with the issue of blood had to jump up and fight her way through a crowd. It would have been a lot easier if Jesus would have just come over to her, but she stepped out of her comfort zone. Some of us just need to be sick and tired of being sick and tired and shake off the dust, shake off the past and recognize where God is taking us. So would you do this? Lift your hands. I'm telling you across all locations, there's a spiritual shift that's about to happen in your life. Some of you, there's grace for the pace for you to dream again for you to start that business in 2020, for you to fight for that marriage that seems hopeless, for you to fight for that family dynamic, for you to believe God to show up in that area financially. God, I pray right now that as we release and let go of the residue, as we release and let go of the past, we refuse to drag the residue and drag the past of where we've been into our new season of promotion. It's our new season where, God, you're going to unlock purpose and gifts inside of each and every one of us. So right now, God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your healing power. We thank you for your breakthrough anointing. And we will give you praise for everything that you're about to release in our lives. In Jesus' name. Come on, can somebody shout as if he's already done it? 
Shout for your family. Shout for your breakthrough. Shout for your deliverance. Shout for your miracle. Shout for your marriage. Shout for your future marriage. And again, I know this feels super symbolic, but the Bible says the spirit realm is even more real than the natural realm. See, we have a we have a deal at our house. If you ever come to our house, you got to be invited. Don't just show up, y'all. I'm Texas now. I got the all right. The wild west out here. You come to our house. The first thing we do. My wife is a little bit more graceful. I'm a, I'm like it's so great to see. You. Just kick off your shoes right there. Let's take them off because we got babies crawling around. I don't know where you've been walking. You could have stepped in something in the yard. I don't know where you've been because I don't want you to drag the residue of your world into our world. See, the enemy loves this. He loves for you to hold on to things. He loves for you to hold on to unforgiveness and bitterness. He loves for you to hold on to things that have been robbing you of your joy and your confidence for too long. I say we let go of it once and for all. Because the things you've been holding on to have been taking up too much space. So step into this place. Get ready for everything God has for you. And do it with great expectation. Because you can just be a spectator and get to June of 2020 and say nothing's changed, or you can position yourself with expectation, which is the breeding ground for miracles. I've got one last awkward thing for people that don't like to be touched. I want to do something. We've been doing this across all services. Proverbs 27, 17 says, iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. Would you look around this room specifically and all, all of our other locations? Look around. This is what a church like heaven looks like. I can't find the majority. This is a melting pot. Multicultural, multi-generational. This is what I want to do. When the paraplegic was laying on the mat and these dudes came by, we don't know biblically if they were super close or if they were just dudes that walked by and had compassion. But they each grabbed a corner and said, you know Jesus is right here doing a Bible study? Went to the front door, couldn't get in. Could have just set him down and said, sorry, bro. Went around to the back door, couldn't get in. Tried to get through a window, couldn't get in. But with determination and fight, they said, well, why don't we just bust through the roof? Man, that's some audacious faith. So they start busting through. And if you actually look at the house styles in that part of the world, the tiles can be six, eight, ten inches deep. They're busting through to lower him in where Jesus was. Because with audacious faith, they knew if we can just get his storm in front of the Messiah, everything could change. And so they lower him in. And this is why I want to do this moment. Jesus looked at these men and said, it's the faith of your friends that have made you whole. Would you link arms with the people next to you? And then I want you to do this with me. Would you just sway a little bit? Help the white people out. Help them out. <laughs> Help them out. <laughs> Why are we doing this? This just seems ridiculous. My little boy's been studying a lot about trees and we were talking about the redwood tree. He said, dad, you know the redwood tree? has really shallow roots. See, in the midst of storms, the shallowness of the root structure is revealed. So whether it's Harvey or a tropical storm, crazy wind comes through, it just topples and blows over trees. A redwood, if you actually look at it, man, six foot deep, it's not, it's not deep enough. Yet hundreds of acres of redwood trees stand strong and stand in the test of time. Why? Because even though the root structure is a little shallow, a moment a redwood tree is in its own individual state and begins to grow into the ground, it begins to interlock with the other root structure underneath. So when you see one redwood tree in hundreds of acres, it's actually one root structure across all of them. So when the wind blows and the storms come and the trials come, I want you to look around this room and remember this moment that we're better together. I want you to look around this room and remember this moment that if you're weak, I got your back. If you're going through a storm, I've got your back. If you're going through a situation, I've got your back. If you're going through a diagnosis issue, I want you to know the name of Jesus will always be bigger than the name of cancer. The name of Jesus will always be bigger than the name of diabetes and congestive heart issues. So look around the room and tell people, I've got your back. Come on, let them know, I've got your back. I've got your back, we're a family, I've got your back. So when the storms come and the wind blows, we stand firm in our faith as the church, united together. One church, multiple locations. But I want you to remember this moment when March and April hit and you're going through something. 
No, 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 devil, you messed with the wrong person. I got a whole army that's got my back. I got a whole group that's got my back. Because we're one church. Would you lift your hands towards heaven? God, tonight, today, we just thank you for your presence. We thank you for your anointing. We thank you for your faithfulness. The truth is we're better together. If you want to go somewhere fast, I said this earlier, by all means, go alone. But if you want to go somewhere far, we need to go together. Father, I pray that breakthrough is breaking out in families, that encouragement is breaking out in families, that any area of their life that felt hopeless has been under the influence of a lie. And I thank you for peace that surpasses all understanding. I've done this in all the other services. I want to do this again. I want to pray for our pastors as we transition out of one decade into the next decade. Father, right now we lift up our pastors, pastors Jeremy and Jennifer. And even if this isn't your home church, I want you to lift up a prayer for our visionary pastors, our lead pastors. Father, I thank you today for a fresh wind behind their sails. I thank you for greater creativity, a stronger anointing. I thank you for the manifestation of miracles, signs and wonders to break out every time Pastor Jeremy preaches. I pray that his tongue is like the pen of a ready writer. I thank you that everything he puts his hand to prospers and is blessed. I thank you for protection over Miss Jen and their kids. They'll be in no accidents and cause no accidents. I thank you for health, strength, and a sound mind. God, as they lead us into this new decade, the greatest day of Hope City, I pray, God, that they rise up with strength and they feel this army. They feel these this group of believers saying, we've got your back, you lead us, and we'll go. We give you the praise ahead of time for everything you've done and everything you're gonna do in Jesus' name. Come on across all locations, will you shout out loud and give him praise because he is good. So take what's left in the cup, whether it feels a little insignificant or not, and allow God to breathe on it and bless it. Take those gifts, that have been maybe going unused and allow God to unlock them. And then ultimately, kick off the residue. Listen, I know some of y'all are like, but I have to put these shoes back on. It's still, it's symbolic, like, put your shoes back. But refuse, in your quiet time with Jesus, let the enemy know, I'm not dragging this, this mess into where I'm going. You can use it as a story, and you can use it as a testimony, but it does not define you. So get ready. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Daniel, here's the truth. I don't know Jesus as my savior, but I want to. Maybe something in your heart has been convincing you of the fact, this whole service, that there's more to life than the way you've been living it. And you're like, ah, I just felt this stirring the whole time. Maybe somebody lied to you and told you they were gonna buy you a steak if you came today. And you didn't know it was a steak chalupa. But you're here, you showed up. Maybe you're here and you say, I used to walk with the Lord, but this is the last weekend and I just felt like I needed to come back because I got caught up in the prodigal life and I want to rededicate my life with your eyes closed just for a moment across all locations, additional seating. If you're in here and you say, I need to get my life right with Jesus. I need to leave my past in 2019 and step into my new season, decade of favor. I want to walk with Jesus. I'm going to count to three and if that's you, we won't embarrass you. Here's the truth. It's God's job to change you. It's not ours. But it is our job to help disciple you and grow you into the men and women of God. And he's called you to become one, I want to get my life right with God. Two, I want to rededicate my life. Three, today's my day. Would you lift up your hand? I'm looking all over the room. My hands are going up everywhere. I want to make things right with Jesus today. I want to rededicate my life today. I want to surrender some things today. Amazing. You can put your hands down. Now look at me really quickly. Here at Hope City, and I can say this is family now. I might be like a weird cousin, but I'm family. All right. We don't pray prayers for symbolic reasons. What we're about to do as a leadership team and as a church, is we're about to pray according to Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. It says, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. Watch this. And you will be saved. Slate wiped clean. Pass thrown as far from the east as it is the west. Everything is about to shift from our leadership team to Hope City Worship and everybody in between. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, it's me. I've been living for me and it's not working. From this moment on, I choose to live for you. I lay every mistake, my entire past, and I ask for forgiveness. I lay it at your feet. Thank you for not running out on me, for not giving up on me. From this moment on, I'm gonna live for you. 
for the rest of my days. I confess you now as my Father, my Savior, and my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Hope City, will you give the Lord a shout of praise? Rejoice along with heaven right now. Come on.